This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used, for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome again to this lecture on thermodynamic operations. We are still in the section on distillation and rectification. And I would like to start now the chapter on rectification with an arbitrary feed. Let's start with the nomenclature. We have seen that already a little bit in the last lecture, but let's look at that in a little bit more detail. Here we see the rectification column, so to speak, in its entire beauty. We see the number of theoretical stages. The numbering starts at one at the top and the number of theoretical stages that, that we have is capital N. Somewhere in the, in the middle of the equipment, not exactly in the middle, but somewhere we will define later exactly where it should be in the optimal case, we have the feed. So the feed is entering some stage NF and the F indicating the feed stage. The feed is called f dot, f uh, the dot again referring to something per uh, time, it has a composition xfi. This feed is now splitting the column, the equipment, in two parts. On the one hand side the rectifying section towards the top and the stripping section towards the bottom. At the top of the column or the head of the column we have the vapor that is leaving the first stage that is being condensed in the condenser with the corresponding cooling power, Q dot D. The liquid is then split into two fractions. On the one hand side our product, D dot, with the corresponding composition. It's a liquid now, so it's an XDI. And of course, uh, we uh, assume that we have complete condensation, so it's, there's no vapor left, so to speak. So we don't have to regard equilibrium or something. So what is entering actually is exactly what is leaving, if you would set up a corresponding balance, so to speak. And so that the xd equals the yd that is entering the condenser. The second fraction that of uh, that what is being con has been condensed is then fed back into the first stage and constitutes a so-called reflux. The reflux generates in the end the liquid that is flowing downward, whereas the reboiler, as we will just see in a moment, is producing the vapor essentially. In the rectifying section, we have the liquid, which we want to call L dot, and the vapor, which, uh, vapor flow rate, which we call G dot. Since now the feed is entering somewhere, the flow rates have to change from above to below, and that results in a different nomenclature, of course. So the liquid here is the L dot prime, and the vapor flow rates is G dot prime. We will actually discuss in a second why the G dot and L dot are constant in the rectifying section and why the G dot and L dot prime are constant in the stripping section. But they, of course, have to differ directly. We can see that because there's a flow rate in between. So that makes, the feed makes a difference between the flow rates up here and the flow rates down there. And as I said, we will just discuss in a moment why the flow rate in each section are, uh, can be regarded uh, as constant under certain assumptions. Okay, but let's continue first with the nomenclature. We have the uh, bottom uh, or the sump down here. We have the reboiler. We know that already actually. The reboiler produces a so-called boil up that is entering the last stage. This can be built in different ways. This is one way to uh, represent that in this graphics. You can also heat up directly or add the heat directly to the last uh, stage if you like. That finally leads to, this, to the same things, more or less, the same balances. The reboiler duty is Q dot B. The uh, bottom product or the bottoms is again called B dot with the composition XB for all the components I. Okay, so this defines more or less the nomenclature. Now we should have a look at an individual stage and see how that is actually looking like. And we see that, of course, for a theoretical stage, we realize that we would have to use the full nomenclature. And what we want to call those things always, after the stage, the, they, the, the streams are leaving. So if this is stage number n, then this is 
the, the g dot n, this is the l dot n with the corresponding composition. So the streams that are leaving a theoretical stage are carrying the index of that stage they are leaving, which means, of course, that the uh, flow rates or the compositions corresponding with or having the same index, they have to be in equilibrium. Yeah, so they are linked with the equilibrium condition because, again, we assume that this is a theoretical stage. Okay, of course, since we start counting from the top, the liquid coming from the stage above is the L dot n minus 1 with the corresponding x n minus 1 and the g dot coming from the stage below carries an index 1 above this n, so it's g dot n plus 1 with the corresponding vapor composition. And I mentioned to you that we want to discuss a little bit about the flow rates. And the point is actually, as we have seen in the section on distillation cascades, that there is some heat and mass transfer occurring on this stage. So the entering flow rates, apparently they are not in equilibrium. Then here some heat and mass transfer occurs. And that has to be exactly such that the leaving streams are in equilibrium. If we now assume that the enthalpy of vaporization is independent of the compo components, so that all components have the same heat of vaporization, then only some things can happen and they have to be linked somehow. What can happen? As we have seen before, here some uh, light, uh, light uh, some uh, sorry, some heavy boiling component is entering here, is being condensed so as to leave with this liquid stream and here some light boiling component is entering as a liquid and is being evaporated partially uh, to leave with the g dot n. This leads, so to speak, to a shift in composition. It's not complete, it's just a little shift, so to speak, so the uh, light boiling component is partially evaporated, the heavy boiling component is partially being condensed so that this composition is the composition of this flow rate is richer in light boiling compared, uh, component as compared to this, and this is richer in heavy boiling component as compared to that. That means there is some partial condensation and evaporation uh, occurring on this stage due to this intense material and uh, energetic contact, the direct heat transfer. And of course, if now the enthalpy of vaporization is the same for all components, then the amount of uh, heavy boiling component being condensed here has to be exactly equal the amount of light boiling component that is evaporated there. And that means, of course, that the, this g dot n plus 1 is being depleted by a certain amount of heavy boiling component, but is enriched here with the same amount of light boiling component. And that means that this g dot has to be the same as that. Same here. This here is being depleted by a certain amount of light boiling component that is transferred to this g dot n, but gets some heavy boiling component so as to become then the l dot n. So these l dots are the same as well. And that of course holds as long as there is no feed stream. So within each section, the rectifying section, as well as the stripping section, the flow rates the overall flow rates are constant as long as we can assume that the heat of vaporization or the enthalpy of vaporization is independent of composition. Okay, this is called the equimolar condensation and evaporation. We will dwell on that a little bit in the more in detail on the next in the next video, but I just want to mention it like like that in this I think easy to memorize way so that you know what it is all about. In the next video I will uh, show how, what, how one can derive that exactly. Now since we are already in discussing the details uh, of what's going on, we should first perhaps write down some assumptions that we want to make, including this, uh, so that we can continue later on and uh, set up the corresponding balances. So we first want to have a look at the assumptions we make. And the assumptions that we want to uh, make are for one specific design method. And the design method is a graphical method and this is called the Meckertile diagram. So we want to design in the end the Meckertile Tile diagram. And for that we need to make certain assumptions.
and I should explicitly write them down so that you know, to know what we are talking about. In the next videos I will use these assumptions in order to derive the equations and the methods, the graphical methods, that I will show you. On the one hand side we have to assume that we have a binary mixture. Why is that so? Well, the reason for that is relatively simple. As we have seen before, equilibrium can be plotted in a two-dimensional diagram that we can evaluate on the sheet of paper or on the screen if the system contains only two components because then we get nice diagrams. Otherwise, it would be a little bit more complicated. So the binary mixture just refers to the case that we have that we want to plot the things in a proper way, in a quantitative way, and we want to be able to evaluate it on a piece of shape, uh, paper. The next assumption is that the pressure is constant. As in the lectures before, pressure equals constant or is constant means that by that way we define the equilibrium. So it's an isobaric equilibrium that we use at that specified pressure. On the other hand side, of course, we have to ask, does that assumption make sense? Does that somehow depict reality to a certain degree? And we can say yes, because usually one tries to minimize the pressure drop across uh, along the column, the distillation column, for a very simple reason actually, because if the pressure drop is high, then the pressure at the bottom is the highest. And that means that you have, of course, also a higher boiling temperature. You know, if the pressure is high, the boiling temperature of a mixture is higher. And that means that the temperature which uh, at, at which you are operating is higher, that is, if you have some thermal uh, stability problems, they will increase as the temperature rises. Also, you have to supply the heat of the preboiler at a higher temperature level, which is usually more expensive. So actually, you would, ha you would like to limit the temperature at the bottom of the column, and that means that you want to minimize the pressure drop the, along the column. One can say that usually the pressure drop of a theoretical stage is something of the order of two, three, perhaps four millibars, so that a column with several ten theoretical stages has some ten millibars of uh, pressure drop, say a hundred millibars uh, as a typical value. And if now the column is operating at, in most cases, at, at ambient pressure, then this hundred millibar change is not so dramatic that you would have to use a different uh, equilibrium diagram. Of course, this changes strongly if you are in vacuum operation, if your overall pressure is only some 100 millibars or even perhaps below 100 millibars, then you would have to take this into account. But luckily, even then, very often the equilibrium information does not depend so much on the pressure. So the Equilibrium diagram, if you plot it for one pressure, is more or less identical to some different pressure. It changes a little bit, but not, but not so much that the overall evaluation is completely different. That means this is an assumption that is that holds in most, or that is not too bad in most of the cases, but you should check, especially in vacuum distillation. And then we come to as a next block, so to speak, of different um, assumptions that need to be made. We come to this section on energies, enthalpies, and things like that. The first thing that we want to assume is, as we have discussed before, that the enthalpy of vaporization is independent of the composition. That is, if we write it like that, the delta H V of component I, of pure component I, is no function of I. That means all components have the same enthalpy of vaporization. Actually, that holds for most of the organic systems. Only one big exception is water. Methanol to a certain extent, but any larger um, molecules, the um, or com components or hydrocarbons, they have um, values of the enthalpy of vaporization that are very similar. So similar that that assumption is actually not that bad. But be careful if you have an aqueous system, then that definitely doesn't hold anymore. We will see later in the lecture an alternative method where that is being taken account, into account, but for the moment we want to assume that. Then we assume as a next uh, step that the HM, the enthalpy of mixing, is zero. And actually we assume it for the liquid as well as for the vapor, and that results actually um, in the, uh, the 
these two things result in the, the what we can write that the delta HV is no function of the composition. So the enthalpy of vaporization is concentration independent. That is one thing that is required. The second thing that is required is that the column is adiabatic. And if we now have these two uh, fundamental assumptions, we can say what we have derived before, what I have argued about before, that we have this equimolar condensation evaporation. So these two things together, this and that, actually it's three assumptions, but this one and that one, these two lead to the equimolar evaporation and condensation. as we have discussed before, and that leads to the flow rates being constant in each section of the column. So as long as no feed is added or as long as no product is being withdrawn, uh, the flow rates are constant within each section of the distillation column. Then for the balances, we also want to assume that we are in steady state. We know this actually already from the single stage continuous distillation and I also mentioned that already in the introductory section. And the last thing that you want to assume is that the condenser leads to boiling liquid. So this is more or less everything I have here on my list so to speak. These are the assumptions, so we assume that the condenser really just condenses and doesn't cool any further. If that is the case, then the liquid entering the first stage is in boiling conditions, and that allows to say that the reflux ratio, uh, the reflux, uh, the reflux, the R dot, again according to this equimolar evaporation and condensation, has to be the same as the liquid in uh, the uh, in leaving the first uh, stage in the distillation column. But we will discuss that later when we, more, in more detail when we uh, set up the balances. So these are the assumptions that we want to make and with that I have introduced on the one hand side the nomenclature, we have seen the assumptions and in the next videos I will show you how one can set up the balances first to show that the equimolar condensation and evaporation can really be proven with these assumptions and then we would set up the balances in order to design this or to, to derive this McCaptier diagram. So thank you for now and hope, I hope to see you again in the next video.